can y'all see me as well? I I cannot. Oh yes, there you are. Yes. Oh, okay. Just so you guys know that I'm not dozing off during the presentation. <laughs> Um, and uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, y'all, for for joining me. All right, I got a yes there, a confirmation. So today, uh, yeah, we'll be talking about crepe myrtle bark scale. So some of you uh, maybe already noticed it in some of your landscape settings, uh, some of the nursery settings. This pest um, is an invasive that has been problematic just within the last ooh, decade, decade and a half that it's really first been seen and, and kind of been spread. Uh, I am based out of East Texas with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and I serve mainly the greenhouse nursery and or ornamental industry uh, in, in this area and in kind of all across Texas as well. But, so just before we jump in, I'm sure a lot of you that are uh, here are probably very familiar already with uh, just crepe myrtles in general. Uh, crepe myrtles are incredibly popular uh, landscape of plant and have been cultivated for over 175 years now uh, in the US. It's a common landscape plant because it's very low maintenance, very easy to, uh, to keep, um, and it's valued at over 46 million in nursery crop sales in 2009 alone. Um, and, and it was kind of the trends were showing that that uh, value was just increasing year after year. So it's a good high value crop, very low maintenance, very few key pests, some of which uh, include one are flea beetles, which, uh, you know, they cause little uh, holes, a little chewing damage in the leaves, not considered detrimental, uh, especially in the landscape. Uh, you know, their damage is, is not very noticed. It's uh, usually not that, that uh, big of a uh, problem. We also have an aphid that's very specific to crepe myrtles. Now, these are the only other uh, organisms that are, at least in our area, so prolific that they can cause a honeydew and sooty mold production that we'll see here later. So that's that black sooty like substance that you get on those trees. And this aphid, uh, they actually cause uh, sucking damage on those on the leaves. So they are only found on the leaves. You take a little bit of a closer look, you can see they have what almost looks like little spines on their backs, right? They're not actually uh, harmful in any way. And some of the adults can be winged for dispersal. Uh, and again, you know, if you get a lot of uh, a lot of this crit myrtle aphid, they can cause honeydew and sooty mold production. And you can get some lady beetles, uh, mainly what appears to be the multicolor Asian lady beetle that comes and uh, feeds on these aphids. So you have some beneficial insects that will naturally come in and clean them up. So they won't actually uh, kill a tree. Uh, we have a glass of green sharpshooter as well, which can sometimes find its way on crit myrtles uh, too. These are kind of a fun little pest to deal with because they, uh, it's not fun if you're actually dealing with them, especially with some of the diseases they, uh, plant diseases they carry. Uh, but uh, when you approach them, you approach those branches, they'll actually go on the opposite side of the branch, almost trying to hide or avoid you. So they're a very neat uh, kind of way of recognizing people and, and trying to avoid them at all costs. I think there's some of us that are like that as well. Uh, so we had uh, in 2004, a uh, colleague, Dr. Mike Merchant, he's uh, based out of the Dallas area. He got a phone call from some uh, landscapers that said that they were starting to get uh, these white spots and a lot of sooty mold buildup on crit myrtles in the landscape. And this is rather unusual because it, nothing like that had quite been reported on crit myrtles before. And it was thought that it, it's possible that it was some kind of a host shift. Uh, so sometimes we have some pests that are uh, pretty specific to certain groups of plants. So in this case, in this case, we have the azalea bark scale, which gets on azaleas. And every once in a while, you can have perhaps a, a subset of a population that has adapted to a new host. It's, it's not very common, but it can happen. <clears throat> so originally, since we had nothing else on crepe myrtles, it was thought maybe that's what was going on. Maybe we had a host shift. Another possibility was that this was a new introduction. It was a new pest that we never had here in the US. So upon further investigation, it was found that in a lot of parts, uh, different parts of Asia, there is actually a, a scale insect that gets on crepe myrtles, where crepe myrtles are actually native. Right? They've been cultivated here, but they're not uh, native here. And their native habitat, uh, you know, taking a closer look, you can see here on these crepe myrtles, there's actually this black a soot that's actually built up on the branches. And there's that crepe myrtle bark scale present there as well. 
And so this was something that was uh, kind of already established there and is quite possible that was moved over. Uh, maybe someone was bringing back some cuttings over from China, uh, maybe over with a shipping container or something and ended up establishing in the landscape here. And from there, it kind of spread far and wide. And so here, this is how they kind of determined, uh, you know, do we have a Zelia bark scale or a criminal bark scale? They start looking for physical differences. So here on the uh, the left side, we have the uh, azalea bark scale on the right side is the crepe myrtle bark scale. If you'll uh, look very closely, the hairs on the azalea bark scale are a little bit longer and a little bit more cone shaped. So next time you're looking at crepe myrtle bark scale, look for that. I'm just kidding. This is like, this is not something that you would notice, not even that I would notice, right? So this is where we have taxonomists that specialize in looking at these tiny little features that are consistent within a species to determine differences. And they found that there were actual differences between the azalea bark scale and the crepe myrtle bark scale. And, our, and what we found, the crepe myrtles closely matched the scale that was found on crepe myrtles back in Asia. So it was confirmed to be uh, an introduction, it was further confirmed after that with uh, DNA testing and molecular tools as well. So it was first seen, uh, first spotted in, in 2004, I should say really first reported in 2004. It's possible it was found a little bit earlier than that as well, just north of Dallas, Texas. And it is now, I'd say relatively ubiquitous. It's kind of found everywhere. Now the distribution is relatively patchy. So even though it's found in a particular state, it doesn't mean you'll find it everywhere in that particular state. Even within our city of Tyler, Texas, we have certain uh, areas of the city where there's higher populations than others. And, uh, you know, we're still learning about how, you know, the distribution pattern, how they move around. So it might be on uh, larger animals, it might be on birds. So in, in some examples, they've seen some scale insects and uh, in their crawler states and climb onto the feet of birds and, and moved around that way. Uh, and then we also have some other examples of uh, some scales climbing onto larger insects moving around that way as well. So these are all different possible routes of uh, the criminal bark scale kind of spreading uh, kind of all over. You can see here on the left side, so this image, what you're seeing are uh, essentially egg sacs. So it's a large round uh, white object is an egg sac. And the smaller, you'll see the smaller ones that are more oblong, these are male pupa. So essentially when they come out of the egg sacs, and we'll see the life cycle a little bit later on, uh, you first get these uh, crawlers, so they're these small little nymphs that are the, the mobile stage, really. And they'll move around and find a good spot to establish and start feeding, and they'll start to go through uh, different instars, different molting stages, until eventually it becomes either another female that forms this white wax around her and, and becomes an egg sac, or uh, pupates as a male, becomes a winged male, and can actually fly. And as a winged male, will then find another female mate and continue uh, the beautiful cycle of life. Now, I will tell you, be careful. There are things in the news, right, that will tell you things like, uh, you know, that this is going to kill the crepe myrtles. And that is not true. So I have found uh, virtually no evidence demonstrating that crepe myrtle bark scale will kill crepe myrtles. Now, I wouldn't be surprised in a nursery setting if you had some very young cuttings or if you had some very young plants and had a very high population, you could get into a situation where you might see mortality. But in the landscape, I have yet to see uh, any scenarios in which crepe myrtle bark scales actually killed the crepe myrtles. There is uh, anecdotal evidence that it might reduce flowering of crepe myrtles. But again, we don't have replicated data to support that at least to my knowledge yet. I have not seen replicated data demonstrate infestation of crepe myrtle bark scale reducing flowering either. Uh, and so really what it does is it hurts the aesthetics by get all these white spots on there and you get uh, the sooty mold. Um, another potential concern here is that it has a number of potential hosts in the literature that they found back in, in China. So based, based on where they came from, uh, they say that you can get a pomegranate, axlewood, Chinese hackberry, persimmon, common fig, soybean, border privet, and many different rubus species. So that would be a major concern if you can actually get on those. We're right now doing uh, a number of tests. Uh, collaborator Dr. Meng Meng Gu is doing a number of tests to determine uh, what are some of these alternate hosts that they actually can uh, get on, you know, to try and confirm uh, some of this here. 
In terms of crepe myrtles, you know, they, they go, they can grow currently the cultivars that we have anywhere in the USDA hardiness zones between uh, this green area and further south. So if you're in those regions, uh, there's a good chance you may, you know, or you at least can have crepe myrtles in the landscape. And I know, especially farther down south, we have a lot of crepe myrtles in the, uh, in the landscape. So uh, that is something to keep an eye out for. We've also uh, confirmed crepe myrtle bark scale now uh, in two different landscape sites. So in two different situations, separate situations, we've seen crepe myrtle bark scale get on beautyberry. And so that's another uh, thing to be watchful for. So this is for Calicarpa species that it can uh, actually get onto uh, and something to be aware of. We've now seen also in caged trials. So this is a little bit more of a, um, a no, we call it a no choice experiment, right? We gave them no choice to see if they could establish if they have no other choice in the environment. And we've seen that they can get, again, on American beautyberry. They can establish on pomegranate. Now, again, uh, I've seen situations where there are crepe myrtle trees right next to pomegranate trees in the landscape, and there were none on the pomegranate, at least not yet. Uh, but that's not to say that if there was a situ situation where there are some nymphs on that pomegranate, they can't walk all the way to that crepe myrtle. They, they may establish on that pomegranate. Maybe it depends on the species. So, um, so there's still some things that we're not so sure about, but at least in, in controlled cage settings, we've seen that they can establish on pomegranate. We've also seen it on um, some other uh, some some other host plants such as henna, uh, winged loosestrife, uh, some others here as well. Here's a few others: purple loosestrife, European wand loosestrife, and California loosestrife. So these are all um, some other potential host plants that that we might. Uh, be be watchful for. So in terms of the general life cycle and, and how they cause damage, you saw that sooty mold right there. Here are their uh, first instar uh, crawlers, right? So when they first come out of the eggs, they're kind of crawling around that branch again, finding a good spot to establish. And it's not until they've established that they start kind of forming some of their that that uh, those waxy hairs. And it's not really until the uh, really matured. You can see the size of the male pupa relative to these nymphs. So the immatures are really small and hard to see with the naked eye. Uh, so by the time you start seeing those egg sacs and male pupa, you know you already have a lot of immature, potential immatures on that tree as well. Going through here. You can also see here, this is just the tip of a needle. Again, just for uh, relative size of, uh, you know, how, how small those uh, criminal bark scale are. And this is an egg sac. So when you open it up, there's actually several uh, individual eggs in there. Uh, you know, I think I, I counted several, and on average, there's uh, about 108 eggs per egg sac, if not more or less. So that was just a, a small little uh, sample that we took. So there's a good number of uh, immatures that can come out of each of those egg sacs. And a very high infestation, if you haven't already seen one, can really cover those branches. Again, like a lot of sucking insects, so they're they're sucking up that sap, and they're trying to get nitrogen. So with that nitrogen, they can make more amino acids. With amino acids, they can make more proteins. With more proteins, make more babies. These things are just baby making machines, all right. And in the process of doing so, they're going through a lot of sugary sap uh, of the plant, and they're excreting that, and that goes on the tree. And this concoction of molds can grow on that sap, known as sooty mold. And so that's where we get this black mold that will kind of form on the branches, some on the leaves, uh, and on lower surfaces. If you've got a car parked under it or any kind of concrete under it or anything like that, uh, you can get that sooty mold buildup. The sooty mold itself, again, it won't necessarily kill anything, but it can uh, really hurt the aesthetics. And that's, that's the major problem, especially in the landscape that people complain about, is the, how it affects the aesthetics. In a nursery setting, we're typically dealing with uh, potential loss of sale, potential uh, culling of a whole lot of crepe myrtles if you have any infestation. And so for them, they have practically a zero tolerance for crepe myrtle bark scale. So here's that uh, nymph again, just for uh, relative scale on a 0.5 millimeter um, a scale right there. So they're about one millimeter in length. And here's that uh, female. If you take a female out of the white waxy uh, little case that she's made for herself and, and dissect her 
Uh, so you can see here are all the individual eggs uh, that are coming out. So I found anywhere between 60 to 250 eggs per female. Uh, and this is what the winged male looks like right here. So in terms of their current distribution, we're actually mapping this uh, using ed maps. So if you've ever uh, used that before, it's an excellent resource for tracking many different invasive uh, insects and plants. And uh, here you can see, I mean, it's pretty, it's, it's relatively ubiquitous. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Florida already as well, but perhaps hasn't been uh, spotted yet. Um, and, and so it goes, you know, relatively far west. And again, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not uh, further distributed than this, but just has not yet been reported. And speaking of which, if you're from one of these regions uh, and you know there are crepe myrtles outside, uh, keep a close eye on, uh, out for, for them and, and look for them. And if you actually ever find any, you can go to edmaps.org forward slash CMBS, and uh, you can actually report uh, this crit myrtle bark scale. So you go in there and uh, you put in the, the pest and the host and the date, and uh, you report this, and it'll come to one of a few of us, myself or a few other collaborators, and we can confirm that. Make sure you have a photo in there. If it's, again, those white spots on crit myrtles, it's almost undoubtedly a crit myrtle bark scale. So that would, that would really help uh, to flesh out kind of distribution of this scale. So today I want to discuss, uh, so now that we've gone over kind of the general biology, I want to kind of go over um, some of the research we've been doing on trying to understand a little bit more about their population dynamics and how to best manage them. And so this is, again, the work of myself, but also several collaborators, some of the co-authors you saw there uh, on the first slide of my presentation. But first, you know, one of the first things we want to investigate, is there any cultivar resistance? Are there any cultivars that uh, do not appear to get crepe myrtle bark scale? And this was, uh, you know, just a very preliminary uh, data that I'm gonna show you based on some field observations that we made. So this is not um, manipulated data or manipulated experiment. It was observational uh, data. And so we'll go to that, into that here in a moment. Uh, next thing was looking at population dynamics. So, uh, you know, when, when do their populations increase or decrease? That gives us a better idea of how to time any insecticide spray applications. Um, so that goes into population control. And lastly, the role of natural enemies and beneficial insects. Whoops, we have a number of other uh, objectives that are now being uh, tackled as well, but uh, I won't go into these. These are uh, part of some other uh, collaborators works that includes non-chemical control, host plant tests, uh, insecticide residue analysis, and consumer preference surveys. So with that first one, cultivar susceptibility, uh, we went over to the crepe myrtle trails in McKinney. So this is ground zero of crepe myrtle bark scale just north of Dallas, uh, where we first, you know, it was basically first reported. There are over 120 cultivars of crepe myrtles uh, in that, that region. And so what we did was we looked at um, a certain subset of those, a reasonable number of them, uh, looked at several trees uh, within each cultivar and several branches within each tree. So those are our subsamples and try to determine if there are any cultivars that don't have, have the scale at all. So here it is, you know, we had a tree, at least five trees per cultivar, and looked at three branches. We looked at all those under the microscope and uh, counted the scales. I want to give you a disclaimer here, right? So you're going to see some differences uh, in terms of the number of scale that we found on different cultivars. But that could just be due to circumstance, right? So if some of them were a little bit closer to ground zero or closer to where a bird landed that had scale, it's going to, by chance, have much higher number of scale, not because it's less resistant. The takeaway of this data right here, so on the x-axis, in the bottom here, we see all these different cultivars. So Tuscarora, Lipan, Pink Ruffles, Tuskegee, all the way over to Natchez. And on the y-axis, we see the mean number of scale per 30 centimeters of branch. So the higher it is, the more scale we found on, on that particular piece of branch on that tree. And so based on this, we may falsely conclude that Natchez, Twilight, Terrace River, Miami are uh, you know, very resistant or, or uh, not very susceptible to crepe myrtle bar scale infestation. But in fact, here in Tyler, Texas, uh, we actually have mostly notches in the landscape and they are highly infested. And so real, the takeaway here is that based on our observations, we did not find any cultivars that were completely free of crepe myrtle bark scale. All of them had some infestation 
At this point, you know, we take some of these cultivars, and we'll do some uh, essentially much more controlled tests where we introduce a set number of scale onto each of those trees and see how the population growth is between all those and see if there's any differences. And that gives us an idea uh, if there's any differences in resistance to the scale uh, based on the cultivar. You know, there's been uh, some other uh, personnel that sometimes have said, you know, well, those purple, le or purple leaves, the new black diamond or purple leaf uh, crit myrtles uh, are resistant or, or not susceptible. And that's, uh, to my knowledge, not quite true. So uh, the crit myrtle bark scale, you know, was suggested at one point that it should be called the green leaf crit myrtle bark scale. Um, but uh, that's that's not the case. It seems like uh, crit myrtle bark scale can get on uh, the new purple leaf uh, crit myrtles as well. I've seen in the uh, in the landscape. All right, so now looking at uh, our second objective was the population dynamics. So the idea here is if we can understand when those populations increase throughout the season, right? So you I mean in the winter time, you don't really see too many scales out, right? Uh, but as it starts to warm up, you start to see this increase in the number of scales, especially those crawlers that are moving around those trees. Uh, and it peaks and then it goes down. Then you get these like subsequent peaks later on. If we can get that first peak really before that population establishes, then you can prevent that population throughout the whole season. And so for this, the, the purpose was to try and understand uh, when do those peaks occur so that we can best target them. So to catch those crawlers that are moving around on those branches, so they crawl up and down those branches, we're using highly sophisticated method known as double-sided sticky tape, exclusive to us entomologists. Uh, but you can also find at your local office supply store, and you wrap that branch. So we're wrapping branches around with this double-sided sticky tape, so it's touching on both sides. And uh, we remove it every single week and replace it, put a, put a new piece up. Take that old one, put it on a piece of grid paper, and you can actually count uh, those crawlers on there uh, week after week. So we did this, uh, you know, five, at least five branches per tree, at least three trees per location, and we had multiple uh, locations uh, with different collaborators. And so this is what it looks like under the microscope. You can see the little crawlers right here. So this is a very high population starting to build up. And uh, again, so this gives us an idea of the relative change in the scale populations throughout the season. These are the different locations we had collaborators in for this. Uh, Dallas, College Station, Huntsville, Shreveport, and uh, Huma for the uh, data I'm gonna show here. And so here's the data from 2015. So on the X axis uh, is the month, is the date really, uh, from January to December. And we have all the different locations. So Tyler, College Station, Huntsville, McKinney, Shreveport, and Huma. Our Y axis is the mean number of crepe myrtle bark scale. So as these lines increase, I should tell you, oh, that's an increase in the scale population within that particular area. So you can see all of them have this first initial peak, so peak here, peak here. McKinney kind of missed um, missed scouting a little early, so they missed that first peak. The Shreveport here, you can see Huma also missed. But you can see all of them start to increase. So when I say start to increase, so you can see that point right there, this point right here, this point here, or this point here, all starting to increase towards a peak by around, in this case, around mid-March to uh, beginning of May. If we look at 2016, all right, so now these are the blue dots. Those start to increase in a much tighter window from around mid-April to beginning of May. And lastly, if we look at 2017, it's around mid-March to beginning of April. Again, this is when they start increasing towards a peak. So if we overlay all three of those, it goes from about mid-March to beginning of May. When we look at this data a little bit closer, a little bit tighter, what we find is that very beginning of May happens to be, you can see all three of these lines here are pretty close to when that peak actually happens in, in the number and the crawlers. And so when it comes to actually targeting those crawlers, we want to time any, say, contact insecticides just before we hit that peak, right? We don't want to only hit them when, when most of them are out crawling because there's a good chance that means we've missed uh, this whole you know, first 50% that's already crawled and has already become x right? So we want to get them before they become x or pupa because it's really hard to manage them uh, after that point. So what we're doing here is uh, we want to look at, you know, basically beginning or mid-April 
in terms of targeting our uh, contact insecticides. Now, I should give you a disclaimer. Again, this is based on mostly Texas data, and we have some Louisiana data here too. And this could vary a little bit depending on your region. And if you're interested in kind of collaborating and doing some of these collections, I mean, let me know. It'd be really interesting to see how these trends may be different uh, for some of these different regions that, that y'all are from. I should also note, so, uh, you know, even though in this last trial, you know, we kind of decided, all right, so that kind of mid to begin, uh, mid to, to end of April is kind of maybe when we want to do our contact insecticides. Uh, there's some work that, uh, or I should say some observations that have noticed that they start to, they overwinter, they survive the winter as these second instar nymphs or as these older nymphs. You can see here them aggregating. This is just a couple weeks ago here in Overton. And we were having some uh, sub-freezing temperatures, and yet these are alive nymphs on that tree. And you can see them right here as well, a little bit further out for some perspective. And so it's possible that you might be able to hit them even earlier. So if we do an early season application of an insecticide, maybe you can get them before you even get that first peak at all. And so that's what we're going to be playing around with um, is looking at timing of insecticide applications as well to try and hit them even earlier and, and see how uh, whether that increases uh, effectiveness. Now, there have been some questions as well. Oftentimes, uh, people who have observed criminal bar scale populations, it looks like the, the infestation goes from the lower part of the branch over to the upper part of the branch throughout the season. And so we want to test for that. So you can see here this double-sided sticky tape on the lower part of the branch. We have some on the upper branches. We had a second reason for doing this as well, because a lot of people would ask in terms of monitoring, does it matter where you put that tape, right? I mean, if I put them down here, am I not going to catch them, whereas up here I will, or vice versa? And that's because, also related to our, our protocol, where we would say, you know, put our double-sided sticky tape at a breast height, well, that can vary drastically depending on what breast height is for you. So notice for me, my breast height is the top of the head of Dr. Meng Meng Gu, right? A collaborator in College Station. I am a tall fella, all right? And she is not particularly tall. And uh, as you can see here, this, there's a huge discrepancy in terms of where you're placing that tape. So we, uh, so Dr. Meng Meng Gu actually put on 10 different trees, actually 12 different trees, tape on lower branches and upper branches and observe them throughout a season to see if there's any differences. This is going to be um, really fun to stare at while you're eating lunch. Ooh, what? Uh, why? So many graphs. The takeaway, there's a, there's a main takeaway here, all right? So each one of these boxes represents a different tree. So there's a total of 12 trees. And you can see here the, the oops, pardon me, the x-axis represents the month. The y-axis is the average number of criminal bark scale uh, per square centimeter. And the main takeaway that I want you to get here is that the black line and the red line, that's the upper branches and the lower branches, track each other pretty closely for every single tree. Now, even though the amplitude might be a little bit different, right? Like here, the red line is a little bit higher than the black line, but they both increase at about the same time, all right? And that happens for about all of them. We found there's no statistically significant difference between upper branches or lower branches. So if you're placing your tape up higher or placing it down lower, there's going to be no statistical difference there. So it seems like they're kind of uh, even, relatively evenly distributed throughout the tree. Now getting on to management with, an, uh, with different insecticides, right? So this is one uh, where you know we had we had a particular church which had a whole lot of crepe myrtles around it, all of which were infested, which is like. Hallelujah for us entomologists, right? That is, that's some holy site right there. And, uh, and we had to come by and first assess which ones were sufficiently, uh, essentially um, infested for us to work with. And we have these different treatments, right? So uh, anyone knows safaris, dinotiferan, merit is a culprit. We've tried oils and uh, azadiractin, uh, acephate and uh, talstar as well. And we had some uh, water, as well to see how well our Tyler Texas water would work to manage creep myrtle bar scale. So, uh, you know, we place this double-sided sticky tape around the trees. This is a good uh, colleague, or I should say at the time, he was a, a summer worker, uh, Dr. Patrick Ridzak. Uh, he has now since earned his uh, PhD. 
And uh, so our contact insecticides we applied twice in two week intervals. And again, that was around beginning and mid April. And these are our contact insecticides. All right, so Cephal Molt X, we had our Bifenthrin and our Acephate. Our drenches were applied once, uh, and that's uh, either Metacloprid and Dinotefuran. In cases, so you can see here, we just mix in a bucket and poured it around the base of the tree as the drench. In the case where there's a bit of a slope or some mulch, basically I had to move that mulch around, or if it's a slope, kind of almost make a little bit of a trench so that, uh, that you know, whatever we just poured didn't just run right off. So it's actually staying near the base of that tree and then going down. And uh, would then apply that drench and pour that mulch back over. So in general here, so again, on the x-axis right, is date. On the y-axis is the average number of creep myrtle bar scale per square centimeter. Here, when we did our two spray applications, you can see, so blue is uh, just the untreated check. It's water, right? So this is the number of creep bark scale is practically nothing here initially. And then it starts to increase, and then it decreases, and then it increases again. So we have basically two peaks, right? The reason why I'm showing you all this data, right? You're, you may be wondering, well, why are you showing me this data? Is because sometimes if you are shown just this date, or let's say just this date, and you're not shown the untreated check, it might look like all the insecticides worked very well. They didn't, uh, because the populations naturally have an ebb and flow. And especially because here we're looking at crawlers. So we might have egg sacs and male pupa on there that are not being captured by this particular graph. And so by having an untreated check as a comparison, we can know if our insecticide is actually decreasing it compared to doing nothing, right? So here we can see our water, again, it increases and decreases. If we look at our acephate, which is this red, it also increases potentially even more than the water and decreases, right? So acephate does not do anything. Uh, if you're using that against criminal bark scale, stop. Uh, it, it does not work against criminal bark scale, at least uh, according to, to to our, our research here. Uh, we also found Suffoil and Molt X that have limited control, so it might be providing some suppression. So that's the green. You can see here, a bit of suppression here, a bit of suppression here, a bit of suppression. And that's after two applications as well. So for us, if it doesn't work after two applications, I mean, that's, that's not considered enough. Um, it's not considered enough suppression for it to, you know, be a good choice. Uh, now we look at tau stars, so that's our bifenthrin. You'll notice here that population goes up a bit and bam, it goes right down. So compared to the untreated check, it stays quite low. Later in the season, it increases a little bit and decreases again. So it seems like it provides uh, a good, uh, at least especially short-term control. So the good several months, you might have to do a second application again later in the season to prevent that second peak. Now Merit and Safari, so we actually did those drenches around this time of spray one. Uh, in hindsight, and you'll see some of our other trials here, we apply that quite a bit earlier, and it should have been earlier, because it takes about 60 days for it to get into the plant. So you'll notice here, these two purple colors are our two drenches. They increase a lot, right? So we get a lot of scale. But then after, oh, let's say about, about the end of May, beginning of June, those two purple colors have practically disappeared off the graph. You'll notice there's a little blip right here, and that's about it. And that's because that's about how long it takes for it to translocate into the plant, right? So those chemicals are getting taken up into the plant, and then the scale feed on it, and then they die. And uh, it, they work very well, but you just need to apply them very early. So uh, from here on out, what we did was looking at what happens uh, if you apply that drench, uh, especially when the, when the leaves are just trying to bud out, you know it's taking up water or nutrients. So here was another study, all right? And for the sake of uh, sanity, I'm not gonna go through all of the details here, but uh, this data is uh, published uh, in a publication known as Arthropod Management Tests. It is freely available. You don't have to pay or anything like that. And, and you can find the more detailed data, but I'm gonna go through some of the key points of some of these insecticides that were uh, effective. Now this was in a potted uh, nursery type uh, situation. So instead of the landscape, we're now looking at uh, five gallon pots. This is all the data together, but I'm gonna take it down uh, chunk by chunk. So here on the x-axis, you can see the weeks after treatment from zero, four, seven, and 19 weeks after treatment. 
And again, this is the average number of crepe myrtle bark scale per square centimeter on the y-axis. So you can see the untreated check starts out relatively low. By week four, we have a big peak, a good amount of variation, right? So some of the trees have very low numbers and some of them have high numbers. And then it goes back down again. Now we look at, this is what I call the nuket option, all right? So this is our dinotypharin drench at the time of leaf budding and bifenthrin, two pesticide applications around mid-April and end of April. And so you'll notice here, right, mid-March, we have a population. By end of April, there's practically no population, and it stays low for the rest of the season. That's, I, I don't suggest everyone jump onto that, uh, but it's, I mean, it's a, that appears to clean it uh, for us. Some of our other options, right? So if we do a dinotephoran drench uh, alone, we can see we also get a good decrease, especially by week nine and week 19. It's very close to our nuca option. Uh, our dinotephoran spray, some, some cases a, a drench application is not very practical, uh, and that's more in a nursery setting, right? So in a landscape setting, drenches might be more practical, uh, whereas in a, a nursery setting, a spray may be more practical. And so you can actually spray safari or dinotephoran uh, onto the bark, is what you're, you're aiming for, and it can be taken up a, a little bit through the bark that way as well. And so you can see the dinotephoran uh, spray here, boom, goes down and stays down as well. So it seems to work uh, quite well too. And metacloprid uh, gives us some varying results. So there's been a couple trials now where I found, you know, metacloprid works really well as a drench, and other times, for whatever reason, you know, it does not work that great. So for whatever reason, in this trial, it did not work uh, that great. A few other products that we found uh, can work uh, very well. Uh, buprovazine, all right, so that's this red right here, which you can see by week four, greatly decreased compared to the water check, greatly decreased, so it worked very well. And pyroproxifen, all right, so that's like your, uh, your distance, for example. Um, is one, one or fulcrum are two different products that have pyroproxifen. So here, you know, you spray that and you can see that great uh, decrease there as well. So those are both insect growth regulators that work quite well. We have a couple others uh, that uh, provide some decent suppression a little bit later in the season. So cyanotranilaprol and fupiridiferone. So this is uh, Altus and cyanotranilaprol, I believe is, um, is that mainspring? Oh, let me just double check here before I say it incorrectly here. Um, I believe it was, yeah, it's, it's either mainspring or siloprin. And so they uh, also provide good suppression there as well. Uh, but it's a little bit later in the season. So especially in a nursery setting, if you're worried about those uh, white spots being on that tree, it might be a little bit too late. Uh, that might not be sufficient uh, control uh, for, for actually, you know, getting rid of them. So again, so this is, uh, this data is published, uh, you can look up, but another little takeaway here, right? So there's a nice little table, average number of criminal bark scale per centimeter of sticky tape. So again, that safari drench, uh, the bark spray mixed with some capsule, all right, fulcrum, uh, talus, talstar, and safari drench were all things that were uh, quite well. And you can see compared to the untreated check, untreated check had about 30 scale per square centimeter, whereas some of these others, you know, our nuket option have 0.1 on average. You know, our safari drench and spray have 0.9, also very good. And our talus alone had 1.3 and fulcrum uh, had 5.4. So uh, these are all uh, very good options so far uh, in terms of managing the scale. Now, you know, we always get the question, so now this is the difference, right? So if you do, uh, if you control it versus not control it, right? So our nuke option looks quite clean here on the right side and the left side, you can see all these white spots, thick black sooty mold, all right? And uh, so that's why it's kind of important, uh, at least in the nursery setting to manage it. And we often get this question, like, can you clean what's on the right? Um, Yes-ish, right? So um, it takes a lot of labor, all right, and you, you have to brush it off. We've tried a few different solutions like uh, soapy water, hydrogen peroxide, a few different things to loosen up that sooty mold. Here's my poor uh, uh, student again, Patrick Bridzak. <laughs> you know, I asked them, just, you know, do whatever you can to try to scrub it off and let's go from there, see uh, what kind of trial we can set up. 
to see how much work is required. And it was it was tenuous. It's hard work. And so in a, uh, a nursery setting, I'm not sure if that's very practical. You might wait until the crepe myrtle uh, sloughs off this bark. So you might you know bump it up, keep growing it, let that bark just kind of shed off as crepe myrtles do, and then keep it clean from there and prevent more scale and city mold from forming. I go on the last uh, section here is natural enemies. We do have some uh, natural beneficial insects, predators that will feed on scale. So this uh, right here, it looks like a scale or a mealy bug, but it's actually a, a type of a lady beetle or what we often call ladybugs. Um, it's a type of a, a, a beetle larva that is feeding on uh, that male pupa right there. You can see here the multicolor Asian lady beetle can often be found uh, climbing on those branches quite a bit. In my experience, usually a little bit more associated with uh, the crit myrtle aphid, but they, they may be feeding on the crit myrtle bark scale quite a bit as well. Here are some of the other lady beetles. So you'll see uh, that the ones that are that I typically find associated with crit myrtle bark scale, these black ones with the red spots on, the, on them. So those are beneficial beetles feeding on the scale. Again, here's an example of their larva. It's a little bit more like a mealybug. And here on the left, every once in a while, I get photos of this. This is um, the exuvia of lady beetles. So what is an exuvia? On this larval stage, once the metamorphose, right, it's going from being this little immature larva crawling around to wanting to be a responsible adult, it goes into a pupa, all right, like a cocoon, and it metamorphoses into a new adult and comes out, and this is what's left. So if it actually had the pupa still in there, it actually be whole, you could poke at it and it would, Kind of move around uh, to kind of ward you off. It's a little defense mechanism they have. Uh, but when they come out, that can stay on there for a good year, if not longer. I've seen some exuvia on those trees for a good while. And so uh, that's not a bad thing if you see those on there. Those are uh, lady beetle exuvia. Here's a nice little uh, illustration by Kyle Gilder of some of the lady beetles, again, that you can uh, see on there. There's also some lacewing larvae as well. Those are, again, another uh, beneficial predator. This is a nice picture of Kyle Gilder, a master student who's working on trying to uh, essentially catalog all the different beneficial insects and trying to understand uh, what types of environmental factors might contribute to promoting their populations in the habitat uh, in order to uh, manage the creep myrtle bark scale. So here was a, a list he had provided. This is uh, maybe uh, you know several months old now. It may be updated since, but um, he's doing some good work there at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, Mike Merchant uh, in Dallas, good colleague again. He also did some work trying to understand you know how important are the beneficial insects by excluding them. And so he had a scale treatment, which is a midocloprid drench or no drench, but he also had a lady beetle treatment. So basically like just killing the lady beetles. And that includes things like carbaryl. And I'm gonna mention this for all you homeowners out there, carbaryl, which is seven dust, uh, is kills the lady beetles, but does not kill the scale. So again, if you see this pest, do not treat it with seven dust uh, because you will help the scale. Uh, there are many instances where uh, this is actually detrimental rather than beneficial. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, this is average number of crepe myrtle bark scale. If you treat for the beetles alone, all right, you treat for the beetles, those numbers are around 300, all right? Don't worry about the units or whatnot here. Just know 300, it's a big number. If you don't treat anything at all, that number is closer to 75. So you can see by treating, just killing the beetles, if you just do seven dust, you're increasing the number of scales by more than threefold. So those beetle populations are doing a, a pretty reasonable job at suppressing those scale populations. Now, if you treat for the beetles and the scales, you get the lowest numbers, right? So it just depends on what your, your goal is. We're also looking at what are the possibilities of importation or classical biological control. Again, an excellent PhD student, uh, Texas A&M, who's looking at, uh, looking at some parasitic wasps. So these are uh, beneficials that are highly specific so they won't have any non-targets that they might impact uh, that basically will lay eggs inside the scale and, the, and they would eat the scales from the inside out. So it's basically a movie alien. And uh, he's found four different groups of parasitic wasps of scales back in their native habitat in, uh, in Asia and might be able to find uh, whether they, they have some uh, potential here. So in conclusion, just to kind of summarize, wrap up everything uh, we just spoke about here, 
Uh, the cropper, uh, the, those crawler populations appear to be most active. They peak around uh, May, beginning from near the beginning of April over to over May. Uh, in the future, we're going to collect data across a wider climatic range. So again, uh, that'll give us a better predictive model, a better understanding of the population dynamics throughout different parts of the U.S. In terms of natural enemies, we find mostly uh, lady beetles that can provide about 75% suppression in the landscape. And in terms of management, I'm going to go straight on over to this, which kind of shows everything that uh, I have at least tested so far. And some of our good options and great options include dinotefuran, dinotefuran, and bifenthrin. Sorry, not bifenthrin. Bifenthrin. Uh, uh, pyroproxifen and buprofacine. Some uh, mediocre include uh, Fupiridiferone, cyanotranilaprol, and imidacloprid. Again, imidacloprid only because there's sometimes where it doesn't work, and, uh, and I, I can't explain why. So it's hard to know, um, uh, hard, hard to suggest as a as a good or excellent at this point. Now, we have several products that we know, uh, you know, through testing don't really work all that well, at least based on our trials, and some others that we need to uh, trial some, do some additional testing. We have some uh, excellent resources here at stopcmbs.com. Uh, we have a list of our personnel there, management strategies, uh, all this biology and, and life cycle stuff there. You're welcome to go and check out. And with that, I want to thank you kindly for your time. I want to acknowledge uh, all my summer helpers, uh, our funding agencies, and the co-authors as well for this uh, work. Thank you so much. I know that you would just oh. be hearing like a resounding uh, round of applause. That was that was incredible. What what an excellent oh, thank presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sorry if I went a little bit long there. I was uh, trying to push through. No, you're <laughs> great. This is exactly what we need. Um, All right. Good. We good. did. Yeah. Questions. Some or? questions come in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead, and they will be a little out of order in terms of the subject matter, but you know we'll do our best here. Sure, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting one come in. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Nope, just tons of compliments. Don't even worry about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the map sh uh, earlier in the presentation shows that bark seal comes from um, North China and Mongolia, but the question asker said that I thought the crepe myrtle was native to Burma and South India. Um, can you speak to that, or are there different varieties or? Oh, um, yeah, that I can't fully speak to. That would be a good horticulturalist question. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that, that was kind of the more original uh, kind of habitat, but I think uh, where our population, at least of criminal bark scale, came from is thought to have been from China based on uh, some morphological similarities between our scale and their scale. Uh, in terms of the full kind of plant um, history, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too certain about that. I can't speak on okay. that. Fair enough. Um, do the potential host plants have anything in common with each other? Um, that is anything that would make them attractive to bark scale. Right. Yeah. So that's a very interesting question. So uh, taxonomically speaking, um, I have not seen any similarities. Right. Usually, uh, and I'm trying to find out find that host range slide that I had somewhere up here. Sorry. I think it was. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, looking at these taxonomically, uh, they don't, from my understanding, fall within a specific group. Um, and a lot of times with insects that are relatively specific um, uh, within a, a particular host range can be specific to, again, plants within a particular group. They might go within plants within a certain genus or whatnot. I, I haven't seen, up to, I don't know, to my knowledge, of any particular similarities between these these potential hosts here, even between crepe myrtle and a uh, beauty berry, I don't know of any uh, particular similarities. So that would be a very interesting question. I don't know if, if it is a matter of some some plant uh, chemical characteristic or physiological characteristic. Uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure, but that'd be a very interesting question to investigate. Okay, great answer. Great answer. Um, let great me great non answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's how it goes. And yeah, yeah everybody who, who, are, who um, is presenting these really excellent questions, you know, this could be the next research question that we pursue. So we appreciate all of your input as well. These are good thinkers. Absolutely. 
Um, is anyone calculating um, growing degree day information for crepe myrtle bark scale or the crepe myrtle aphid? Yeah, so, uh, so for the crepe myrtle aphid, mm, not to my knowledge, I don't think anyone has quantified that. Uh, for the crepe myrtle bark scale, so we no, no one is currently doing, um, nor do we know uh, the lower temperature threshold of crepe myrtle bark scale. So that's one of the first things that need, needs to be studied. And then uh, basically doing you know, lab assays of development time under different temperature regimes to develop a, a degree day model. What we did was kind of looking in the other way around. So we have observational data now from uh, those several locations uh, over three different years. And we collected uh, weather station data as well from those uh, three different locations um, and tried to see if we could, if basically if, if weather or temperature was a better predictor of when those first peaks in crawlers uh, would occur versus just average Julian date. So our average Julian date across all of them ended up being uh, landing on May 2nd, whereas our cumulative degree days, you know, it would kind of depend from year to year and location. And what we found was that when we relied on the degree day information, we had a lot more variability. So that model could be off by as much as 60 days, whereas our Julian date uh, had much less variation. So it, it would maybe still be off by two to three weeks at times, but it was at least a lot more accurate than the degree day model that we built. That's not to say that um, a better degree day model can't be built, probably can, but based on what we have at the moment, uh, still kind of a calendar date seems to be a, a better predictor, essentially. That's very well put, yeah, okay. So I think that kind of goes into this next question then. Um, so I know you touched on this, but can you reiterate, how do you time when you spray the insecticides? Yeah, so uh, like, I think it really depends on region, right? So for us, uh, you know, I think it's pretty reliable now based on several years of trapping data that we kind of suggest near uh, near the beginning, first or second week of April, this is for contact insecticides, first to second week of April, and then two weeks later as well, maybe landing close to the end of April. Uh, if you're doing drenches, as soon as those leaves start budding out, because it takes a while for that that insecticide to get in there. When it's in there, it's in there for a good while. So for drenches, uh, like down at Tefiran, as, as soon as it starts budding out. But again, for contact insecticides, you wanna target, uh, based on our most current research, you wanna target those crawlers when they first start to emerge and before they hit that first peak in crawler activity, which for us is around in, in April time. It might be worth, in, you know, if your region is not represented in this data set to, you know, put some double-sized sticky tape on some crepe myrtles and, you know, make some observations. When you start noticing some scales appearing on that double-sized sticky tape, that's when you want to start doing some of those applications to hit them before they become new egg sacs. Excellent, excellent. And, and can you remind us again what those crawlers look like? Yeah. Yeah, let me go what they look like uh, on the actual tape. Uh, let's see. Perfect. Yeah, and folks, don't re don't forget about that EdMaps um, program that you can report. Mm -hmm. um, that that is an excellent resource, and, and a lot of us rely on it. So I, I appreciate you taking us through the how-to of how to do that too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. So this is what it looks like. That double-sided sticky tape. I use the it's like permanent double-sided sticky tape, but just a little bit stickier. Uh, and again, you wrap it around the branch of the tree, and make sure you get you know it's really. Um, you know, you're allowing, you don't want the scales to crawl just under that tape. So you're trying to get it really stuck on that branch all the way around. And a week later, you can either, you know, kind of undo it, or I'd actually just cut it with a little knife and take it off and put up a new piece of tape. I take that tape and put it on a piece of grid paper. When I have a bunch of pieces of, uh, of tape on a, on a piece of grid paper, I, I stick it the, the inside like a plastic sleeve, or if you just want to put a, plastic, a clear plastic sheet over it, Otherwise, you need that sticky tape all over things. That way you can just, you know, put stacks of these if you need to on top of each other. When we look at that, if you have a hand lens, you'd be able to see them. Um, or if you can get yourself, you know, your hands on a, an inexpensive dissecting microscope, um, you know, for around 200 bucks, you should be able to get one and uh, take a look at these under the microscope. Terrific. Um... You can see they're, they're pink and they've got these legs. Um, you know, and if you're just starting to do it and you're not certain, I mean, you can send me some photos and, uh, you know, I can, I can try and help you out. 
assuming I don't all of a sudden get a huge volume of people sending me photos. <laughs> I kind of I doubt that. They are more conspicuous than I was expecting, though. They kind of jump out at you there. Yeah. Hot pink. Absolutely. Um, oh, I've been getting this question. Kind of know. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. That search image. Yep. Um, OK, two, two questions. Uh, folks keep asking, um, have you looked at pressure washing um, in terms of removing honeydew? Uh, yeah. So would, yeah. Okay. So we looked Go at ahead. pressure washing in terms of removing the sooty mold. And uh, yeah, I mean, we blasted. We blast, I mean, we were, we were, we were basically trying, you know, uh, blasting as hard as you can. And if you can get the sooty mold off there, then decreasing it from there to see, okay, what, what is actually a reasonable pressure? We were blasting the trees. And I mean, again, you can remove some of it, but uh, in a nursery setting, probably won't be sufficient. Um, and it, again, still be very labor intensive because you'd have to pressure wash every angle and every crevice and every branch to, to yeah. clean of, of the sooty mold. And in a landscape setting, you know, you, you may do it again, you know, it, it's, it, it may help, uh, but I don't know that it fully cleans it. Again, it's just going to be very labor intensive. So for a homeowner, maybe it'll make sense because for you, it's, you know, a labor of love and it's a part of gardening. But for a landscaper that, you know, time is money and, and or you're getting paid to do that, um, I don't, I think it's hard to justify, at least uh, based on current methods. Yes, yes. And kind of creating a mess inside of your greenhouse. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, how does prune, okay, so folks, I'm sorry, we're running out of time, so I only have time for one more question, but um, I've collected all of these, and um, if you would like me to pass on these questions to Dr. Vafay for, um, you know, a private response, I'm sure we can work something like that out. Sorry. Yeah, sound good. Okay. Um, okay. A little Q&A and post online or something. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah um, no problem. Last one. How does pruning affect infestation? Is the bark scale attracted to wounds in the tree? Um, I don't know that we have any data to support that is attracted to it. Um, pruning, you know, I'm going to say right off the bat, be very careful with the pruned limbs and where you move that around to. So we know that moving a pruned limbs can be another source of infestation. So we've seen like backs of trucks just full of, of pruned limbs from crepe myrtles that are infested driving around town. So don't, so don't do that, like bag it or dispose of it. Um, uh, you know, otherwise, I don't know that we have any data to support necessarily that pruning promotes the, the scale populations or attracts them. Um, you know, sometimes we do find those scales can, again, anecdotally uh, start to initially congregate around some of these uh, pruning scars or some of these these opening areas. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no data to support that it necessarily increases their population. Okay, sure. Oh, that's a really important distinction um, about uh, transporting infested materials. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I, we, we are definitely, we're even, I, we've kept you longer than we even asked, so. Um, uh, I'll just you charge you over time. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it. I've learned so much. Um, Thank you so much for your time. You're such a dynamic speaker. We were really lucky to have you here today. Thank you so much. That was my honor. It was, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Sure thing. Um, and folks, just you can go ahead and you can ch check out our webinar portal and you can see contact information for Dr. Vafai. Um, and um, you can just, uh, this is just a side, but stick around. You can ask me questions if you have problems with step two. Just provide me um, with your web address and we'll go from there. Okay. All right, well, that's about it. We've taken enough of your time. Thank you so much. You have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Take care. Take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye.